Happy Sabbath, brethren, and greetings to all our viewers and friends over the internet. When I, wa when I was a young boy, of about 9 or 10 years old, my mother bought me a book entitled Children Around the World. It was based on true stories of children from different races, cultures, and traditions from all over the world. One of my favorite stories was Why Tado Obey? And it is my purpose this morning, or rather today, to share with you some lessons from the story Why Tado Obey? Tado was an orphaned young Japanese boy. He lived with his grandfather high up on the side of the mountainous region in Japan. All around Tado's house were rice fields. The people of the village came to the rice field every day to work. Tado and his grandfather helped them. Even though Tado was only five years old, he knew the rice fields were very important to the Japanese people. Just like as Filipinos, rice is their staple food. In fact, in Nihongo, the Japanese national language, breakfast is called gohan, which literally also translates as rice. If our millennial people can recall, in the Japanese anime Dragon Ball Z, the eldest son of Sangoku was named Gohan. That's why he became the butt of jokes of his friends and classmates because of his funny name, which incidentally means both rice and breakfast. That only shows how important rice is in the Japanese culture. No wonder then that grandfather had told Tado many times over how, how important the rice fields are. Now allow me to quote directly from the book. large portion of the story with slight modification and some comments. Grandpa said, The rice fields are our food. If anything should happen to them, we would all be hungry. Tado didn't want to be hungry, so he was glad when the rice began to ripen and harvest time drew near. Then one day, something happened that frightened Tado. He and Grandfather were all alone in the rice fields, with Grandfather straightened up to rest. He looked out, he looked out at the rolling sea. For a moment, he turned pale and did not speak. Then he, shout, he shouted loudly to Tado, Run quickly and bring me a burning stick from the fire. Tado ran as fast as he could to the smoldering fire. He seized a stick and hurried back to Grandpa. And Grandfather took the stick and thrust it into the dry rice plants. Bring me another one, he ordered. Quick! Tado was so surprised and confused that for a moment he couldn't move. Then he began to cry. Grandfather, he sobbed, you're burning the rice. Grandfather nodded without looking at Tado. Bring me another burning stick, he said. Tado hesitated at first. Then he thought, of Jesus. He most likely learned some stories about Jesus from Christian missionaries who frequented Japan around those times. 
Tado knew that Jesus would want him to obey grandfather. Perhaps he learned from the Ten Commandments commanding us to honor our father and mother. In Exodus 20 verse 12. Which by extension could include his grandpa who stood in place of his parents being an orphan. Tado then swiftly hurried to bring another burning stick from the fire. Then another, and still another. Soon the whole field was ablaze, and thick black smoke rose up from the mountainside. In a moment, Tado saw the people running from the village down below. Old men and women, even children, were climbing up the mountain range. They were coming up to try to put out the fire in their precious rice fields. As they come close, one man shouted angrily to grandfather, How did this thing happen? Was it this terrible fire? I did, answered grandfather calmly. Why? Why? screamed the man angrily. Grandfather turned and pointed to the sea. All the people turned to look in the direction grandfather was pointing. There was a huge wall of water rolling in, a great tsunami. The sight was so terrible that no one moved or said anything. The tsunami rolled over the land where the village was and broke with a loud roar against the side of the mountain. The people hid their faces from the sight. Their whole village was underwater. Then the people began to smile when they realized why Grandpa had set the rice field on fire. He wanted them to come up quickly on the high mountain where they would be safe. They all crowded around Grandfather and began to thank him for saving their lives. They were not angry anymore. Grandfather, grandfather smiled at them too. Then he said, and I quote, putting his hand on Tado's shoulder, I could never set fire to the field in time if it hadn't been for Tado. He, bought, he brought the boarding stick even though there was no time to explain why I wanted them, and quote. Now, let me call out some lessons from the story. Tado obeyed his grandpa with almost unquestioning obedience because of his simple belief in Jesus Christ. Tado exercised faith in Jesus despite his tender age. So, brethren, just like Tado in our story, let's exercise simple and childlike faith and obedience to God. Let's remember what Christ said in Matthew chapter 18, verses 3 to 5, the New International Version. Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5, And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me also. Likewise, let's also remember the faith of our father Abraham. When God called him from the land of Ur, to go to a place where he would receive an inheritance. He obeyed, not even knowing where he was going. That's how great Abraham's faith was, which is recorded in Genesis 12, verses 1 and 4, and Hebrews 11, verse 8. In conclusion, we don't always have to understand everything before we obey God. 
All we need is to understand God's nature and character. He's always after our ultimate good and that He doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Let us then exercise simple and childlike faith and put it into action by applying it in our lives. By so doing, we will please our Father and Heaven. I need 
Happy Sabbath to everyone. Can you open your Holy Scripture to Ecclesiastes chapter 1? We'll be reading from verses 1 to 9. The words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Who is son of David, king of Jerusalem? King Solomon. Meaningless. Meaningless, says the, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come. Generations go. But the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets. And hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. Verse 7. All the streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams come from, there they return again. All things are worrisome. More than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing. Very true. We all like to see more. No, the ear is filled up hearing. Yes, we all like to hear more. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Let's move down to uh, verse 12. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Ecclesiastes is a book of perspective. The narrative of the teacher reveals the depression that results from seeking success and happiness in worldly things. This amazing book gives Christians a chance to see the world through the eyes of a king who, though extremely wise, is trying to find meaning in temporary human existence. Most form of worldly pleasure is explored by the wise king, and none of it gives him a sense of true meaning. This time, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We read from verses 1 to 11. I said to myself, 
Koi King Solomon said to himself, Come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to, to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem, yes, 700 beautiful wives and 300 concubines. The delight of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused. No, I refused. My heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. And this was the reward for all my toil. Yet all I surveyed all. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands has done and all I, I had told to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. King Solomon tried all kinds of pleasure. Wine, building projects, gardens and pools, great possessions, gold and silver, slaves and singers, wives and concubines. And yet, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. This time let's uh, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. <clears throat> now, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. After exploring everything under the sun, King Solomon came up with this conclusion. And here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Have you ever wondered why King Solomon came up to this conclusion? Today, we will focus on how to fear the Lord our God. Many preachers have already discussed the topic on how to keep the commandments of God. So today, we will focus basically on the fear of the Lord our God. There are two ways to fear God. First, to be afraid and to tremble before His holy presence. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. What do we mean by holy? Perfect in goodness and righteousness. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. Let's, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. We we'll read from verses 18 to 21. 
you have not come to a mountain that can that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness gloom and storm to a, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded if even an animal touches the mountain it must be stoned to death the sight was so terrifying that Moses said I'm trembling with fear let's look at this account quickly it is recorded in Exodus chapter 19 we read starting in verse 16 on the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast everyone in the camp trembled so that when the people verse 18 which move down to verse 18 when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke they trembled with fear they stayed at the distance and said to Moses speak to us yourself and we will listen but do not have God speak to us or we will die Moses said to the people do not be afraid God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning in Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 a very, fa very familiar verse therefore my dear friends Apostle Paul said as you have always obeyed not only in my presence but now much more in my absence continue to what? continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling another way to fear God is to worship Him with reverence and awe Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 therefore since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken let us be thankful and so worship God with what? with reverence and awe this time let's go to Psalms 89 we'll read from verses 6 to 8 for who in the skies above can compare with the Lord for who in the skies above can compare with the Lord who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings in the council of the holy ones God is greatly feared even in heaven even in the council of the holy ones God is greatly feared he is more awesome than all who surround him who is like you Lord God Almighty you Lord are mighty in your faithfulness surrounds you fearing the Lord means to be in awe of his holiness to give complete reverence and to honor him as the God of great glory majesty and mercy now look today now we are going to look at three reasons to fear God three reasons to fear God First, we should, fear he, we should fear God because of who He is. This one, we go to Jeremiah chapter 10. We read from verses 6 to 8. First reason, we should fear God because of who He is. No one is like you, Lord. You are great, 
Your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear you? King of the nations, this is your Jew. This is your Jew, God. All of us have to fear you. This time, Job, chapter 37, verse 20, verses 23 to 24. The Almighty is beyond our reach, which is true, and exalted in power, in His justice and great righteousness. He does not oppress. Therefore, people revere Him. Revelation 15, verses 1 to 4. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass, glowing with fire and standing beside the glass, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. What were they singing? Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord? And bring glory to your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Now we go to the second read, second lesson. We should fear God because of what he has done. Jeremiah chapter 5 verses 22 to 25 Should you not fear me declares the Lord God is asking should you not fear me should you not tremble in my presence I made the sun its bound boundary for the sea an everlasting barrier it cannot cross the waves may roar, but it cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have turned aside and gone away. They say, they do not say to themselves, these stubborn people do not say to themselves, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives autumn and spring rains in season who assures us of the regular weeks of harvest. Your wrongdoings have kept this away. Your sins have deprived you of good. In Psalms 96, we read from verses 4 to 6. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and glory are in His sanctuary. The third reason we should fear God because of the coming judgment. Psalm 76 verses 7 to 8. We should fear God because of the coming judgment. It is you alone who are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you are angry? 
When God is angry, who can stand before God? From heaven you pronounce judgment. And the land feared and was quiet. Let's, this time let's go to Psalms 90 verse 11. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. In Luke chapter 12, we read from verses 14 to 5, our Lord Jesus Christ said, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Our Lord Jesus said, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, Fear him. In Matthew 10, verse 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Don't be afraid of them. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. This time let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 14. We read from verses 6 to 7. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. He had the everlasting gospel to proclaim. So this angel had the everla everla eternal, eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth. To every nation, tribe, language, and people. This angel said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Before we move on with our message today, let's do a little recap. There are two ways to fear God. First, to be afraid and tremble in His holy presence. So when we come before our Almighty God, when we pray before Him, we need to be afraid and tremble in His holy presence. Second, we need to worship our God with reverence and awe. Three reasons why we should fear God. There are three reasons, at least three reasons, why we should fear the Lord our God. Number one, because of who he is. He is our creator, our redeemer, our healer. Second, because of what he has done for you and me. Third, third reason, because of God's coming judgment. There are promises and blessings attached to the fear of God. First, the promise of provision. The promise of provision. Psalms 13, 4, chapter 34, verses 9 to 10. Fear the Lord, you, His holy people. Yes, we are commanded to fear God. For those who fear Him lack nothing. If we fear Him, 
we don't lack any. We will lack nothing. For those who fear Him, lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Psalms 145 verse 19. He, referring to God, fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. Yes, God will fulfill the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cry and saves them. The promise of provision. Second, Second promise, the promise of protection. The promise of protection, Psalms 33, verses 18 to 19. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him. The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him, on those whose hope is in His unfailing love. To deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Yes, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him. Psalms 34, 7. The angel of the Lord and comes around those who fear Him and He delivers them. Yes, God will send angels to guard us. To protect us. Yes. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The promise of protection. Third. The third promise. The promise of prosperity. Psalms 128 verses 1 to 4. Blessed Blessed are all who fear the Lord. Yes, blessed are all who fear the Lord and who walk in obedience to Him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessing and prosperity will be yours. Yes, Pros blessing and prosperity will be ours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. Promise of prosperity. Proverbs 22, verse 4. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages, its payment, its earnings are what? What are the earnings? The wages of the fear of the Lord. Yes, its wages are riches, honor, and life. Promise of prosperity. The fourth promise attached to the fear of the Lord. The promise of prolonged days. The promise of long life. This, this one is recorded in Proverbs 9, verses 10 to 11. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For true wisdom, wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord. For true wisdom, your days will be many, and your years, and years will be added to your life. Isn't it amazing? Our days will be many and our years and years will be added to our life if we fear the Lord our God. Proverbs 10 verse 27 The fear of the Lord adds length to life. So if we want to enjoy a happy a healthy, long life, fear God. There's a promise attached to the fear of God. The fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked 
are cut short. So there are four promises attached to the fear of the Lord our God. And there are also blessings and benefits as well. There are also four blessings and benefits. We look at each one of them. First benefit. The fear of the Lord makes us avoid evil. Number one. The fear of the Lord makes us avoid evil. Proverbs 16, 6. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. Will a person do bad things if, if he has fear of, the, uh, fear of God? Will a person do evil or bad things if he has fear of God? If you think God is watching you, will you do bad things to your neighbor or to anyone? No, of course. Of course not. Of course not. If you know God is watching you, you will never do bad things in your life. So, the first benefit is we will avoid evil if we have fear of the Lord. Second, second blessings or benefits gives us a future hope. This one is recorded in Proverbs 23, verses 17 to 18. Do not let your heart envy sinners. When you see sinners, don't envy them. But always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. What do you mean to be zeal zealous? To be excited. To have strong desire. So we should have strong desire for the fear of God. Do you do, do we have strong desire for the fear of God? Yes, we should have. Verse 20, verse 18. There is surely a future hope for you. Yes, there's a future hope for us. And your hope will not be cut off. We are looking for our blessed hope in the kingdom of God. Third blessings. Draw us. The fear of the Lord draws us near to God's salvation. Psalms 85 verse 9. Surely His salvation is near. The salvation of God is near. Those who fear Him. The salvation of God is near to those who fear Him. For he, that his glory may dwell in our land. So, the fear of the Lord draws us near to God's salvation. The fourth one, the fear of the Lord makes us experience God's love and compassion. Psalms 103 Verses 8 to 13. The Lord is compassionate, yes, and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, yes. These are the attributes of God. The Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse. God will not do that. Nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Very true. Or repay us according to our iniquities. God will not repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. Yes. So great is the love of God for those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so so far has He removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion 
on those who fear Him. Yes, we will experience God's love and compassion if we fear God, if we fear Him. God is happy when we fear Him. Psalms 147 verse 11. When we fear God, and God knows that we fear Him, He's happy with us. Psalms 147 verse 11. The Lord delights. The Lord is happy in those who fear Him. So if we fear God, God is very happy with us. Who put their hope in His unfailing love. So you want to make God happy? You want to please Him? Fear Him. Revere Him. There are eight promises and blessings attached to the fear of the Lord. Let's do a little recap. Promises and blessings. Eight of them. First, the promise of provision. Second, the promise of protection. Third, the promise of prosperity. Four, the promise of prolonged days. Can you imagine that? The promise of provision, God will provide for us. The promise of protection, God will protect us. The promise of prosperity, riches and honor. And the promise of prolonged days, the promise of long life. See, these are the promises attached to the fear of God. And aside from that, the fear of the Lord makes us what? Avoid evil. We will not do bad things. If we fear God, gives us a future hope, draws us near to God's salvation. We'll be nearer to God's salvation if we fear Him. And we will experience God's love, compassion, and forgiveness. Isn't that wonderful? Now, for our closing scripture, kindly turn your Holy Scripture to Isaiah 33, chapter 33, verses 5 to 6. For our closing scripture today, the Lord is exalted, for He dwells on high. Yes, God is in heaven. We are on earth. He will fill Zion with His justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation. God will be the sure foundation for our times. A rich store of salvation, yes, and wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. The fear of the Lord is the key to the treasure of God's salvation, wisdom, knowledge, and all the promises and blessings that are attached to the fear of the Lord our God. Do you fear the Lord our God? Do you fear the Lord our God? I do. And so, must you. So I bless it and a joyful Sabbath to everyone.